All right, hello and welcome everyone. It's Adriel um, and Karen, your favorite DEI folks. Well, some of your favorite DEI folks, I hope, if you're joining us today. <laughs> um, so I'll keep our intro pretty short today. Um, and apologies, I need to mute myself because I hear myself talking and I don't need to hear my voice echoing on LinkedIn Live. Um, but welcome, thanks for joining us. Um, if you were here last week, we spent some time um, unpacking that statement that was basically saying that DEI trainings don't work. Um, and so we really dove into exploring what that even means and why people feel that way. We talked a lot about traditional workshops or trainings. Um, we kind of differentiated training versus workshop, which I think is an important distinction. Um, I always like to remind people, I think of a training as like, you know, here's exactly how to use this phone. Th these are the steps that you need to do X, Y, Z step versus a workshop. I could come in and I'd say, hey, here's some best practices for how to leverage this device for productivity. And then you go and decide which of those best practices, if any, you would like to take on or consider in whatever you're doing to be more productive, right? So I like to think of DEI in the same way. Um, I think it applies even more so. I don't think there's a way to specifically train on DEI. I think there are some aspects that you can train on, right? If we're talking about metrics specifically or how to use this platform to track your metrics. Um, but in terms of training on people, um, I prefer workshops. So again, I like to think about how I can share some knowledge, bring some awareness to the, the group that I am facilitating for, and then um, based on that knowledge and those best practices that we share, how can you then leverage those um, in whatever it is that you're doing so that DEI becomes less of a check, on, a check the box add-on and more of a element that is integrated into all that you do. So just a quick recap, if you didn't uh, weren't able to attend last week, please, please uh, feel free to check it out. I believe it's still live on LinkedIn. And if you need captions for accessibility, um, the same video is also on YouTube, which allows captions. So with that said, we wanted to continue the discussion because we had a lot of really positive feedback and we thought it would be helpful to what we always love to do, take something from theory to practice. And so we figured we would design a workshop in real time. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to stop talking and we're going to just dive into this and, and design a workshop in real time. Um, and so we are going to invite you all. Uh, I know we have some folks live on LinkedIn. We have some folks live on YouTube as well. Hello. Um, but if anyone has a topic that they'd like us to explore, let us know. Um, for context, Karen and I typically spend our time designing and facilitating workshops that are focused on inclusive workplace best, best practices as well as inclusive leadership. Um, I spend most of my time working primarily with uh, leaders, execs, board members, and Karen specializes in working uh, with middle managers. So if there are any topics that y'all are interested in building a workshop for, I'll give you a few seconds. Let us know in the chat. Otherwise, we'll just pull something from the sky and design something. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't have any workshops right this moment that um, I need to design. I just designed a workshop and facilitated one on coaching and mentoring for managers, which was really interesting. That was yesterday. Um, Karen, do you have anything top of mind? Um, yeah, my most recent one is was uh, what exactly makes a good manager? Ooh. Kind of like what, what goes into making a good manager. Um, but yeah, either one of those could work or okay. you know, just keep something super, super basic. Yeah. Um, I think, you know what, I think a good one would be, unless we have, I don't see any, any comments coming in. I think, um, and you can tell we're really doing this on the fly today. We weren't kidding. Um, so one that's been top of mind that I've been helping. Ooh, okay. I see some responses here. Um, George says, how do you put in a diversity program in a diverse workplace that does not celebrate its diversity as of yet, but the company has multiple spread out offices? That would take a little bit more time because yeah, yeah, I, we like, have to yeah, they, even hearing that, I my, yeah, my, my my first thing, even hearing that, I, I have more questions about what exactly you're building. So I yeah, 
Exactly. Um, and then Damika says, what about best practices for inviting gender expansive folks into spaces that are typically binary gendered? Um, oh, yeah, actually, yeah, yesterday was uh, National Non-Binary Day, so that, that is pretty it prescient. Was. It was. We could definitely do that. Um, and George, happy to chat afterwards if you want to um, explore some ideas there. Are, the, part of the thing when you're building workshops is that at least for me, they're always follow on questions, especially when I'm building for a client. Um, and a lot of it involves thought partnerships. So there are a lot of questions that I would follow up with, you know, especially with that particular topic. So what does it mean in that particular workplace to not celebrate diversity? Is it truly everyone does not celebrate or or embrace it? Uh, what is leadership's involvement? What's been done so far? So there are a lot of questions that you have to kind of go through um, right. before you even start to kind of draft or craft uh, what you're what you're building out. Mm -hmm. um, best practices for inviting gender expansive folks into spaces that are typically binary gendered. Um, yeah, I, I still, yeah, I, I, I guess I still have a couple of questions around that one too. Like, um, yeah. kind of what 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 do you mean by that like are, are we talking about um you know are, are we talking about bringing in folks who are non-binary like are we talking about a, a conversation around pronouns are we talking about a conversation around um how to how to even talk about folks who are beyond and within the the gender spectrum like i i guess i think i, I think i want a little bit more information just kind of what we're talking about yeah. before we start building the workshop. Yeah. So say a similar thing, like there are always follow-up questions. Um, I think one that might be helpful and touch on both of these, uh, one topic that I've had a lot of interest in is um, just fostering and building inclusivity in a remote working environment. And this is something Karen and I have talked about. So maybe we can start to build around that um, and keep it pretty general just to give you a sense the idea today is really to give you a sense of how we think about building workshops and how we go about doing it so maybe we can start with that um and Tamika says great question i think the best start is how to talk about people who are beyond the gender spectrum in binary spaces so how okay. to talk about people who are non-binary um, is what i'm getting um and i again that kind of gets into the weeds and happy to talk offline but i think we want to try to keep this more general in terms of the actual process for building a workshop today um so let's as you see again we did not plan this <laughs> this is really going off the cuff um so first things first right um there are always going to be a lot of questions that you have to ask and that you need to follow up on uh, as you're building workshops um, in terms of the actual presentation itself i always like to keep things very simple you'll see i just grabbed a theme from a site called slides carnival um, i generally work with black and white slides for accessibility purposes um, and so you always want to be mindful of the needs of the audience that you're presenting to and that might require you to ask whoever you're partnering with as you're designing this workshop um, but always, always make sure that you are covering your bases to make this as inclusive as possible. You can't be preaching about inclusivity and then not actually considering it, right? So being mindful of things like color uh, on your on your screen. Um, I also have, I work in slides. Typically, I like slides because you can add speaker's notes at the bottom and you can go into a presentation view. Um, there's also an option in Google if you do use slides to enable accessibility options. So I find that to be useful. I think I've only had one person ever since I've been facilitating virtually um, require the screen reader uh, feature and it worked fine. So just something to put out there and be mindful of. So I grabbed this theme. I like it because it has, you know, a good variety. It's black and white, very simple. It has some template themes that I know I can plug and play with. If I need two columns, if I need three columns, if I need to drop a graph in here for whatever reason, or just share some sort of process or data sets, it's right here. Um, so I'm a huge fan of very straightforward templates. If you are not a designer or creative person, there are tons of folks out there that can help you uh, put your presentation together. But for the purposes of today, we're gonna work with this theme. So 
I imported it into a clean slate and we said we're gonna be working in a remote environment, right? So inclusion in a remote environment. So first things first, how do we start here? Um, so I always like to begin with goals and objectives. So, and this font is really small on this particular theme. So I would actually increase this um, just so people can, for ease of readability. But goals and objectives, what are we trying to accomplish today? I like to keep my goals at no more than three points, three bullet points. If I can, sometimes I'll just have one sentence. Karen, any thoughts on how you typically approach your goals, objectives for your sessions? Um, yeah, that, that I usually like to keep them as kind of a series of bullet points, maybe no more than five in total. Um, and I pull my goals directly from the conversation I have with my clients, kind of going back to, I've been kind of sitting here ruminating on the conversation of how do you introduce the concept of people beyond the, the gender spectrum or within the gender spectrum into an environment. Um, yeah, I like that. I would, I would have no more than five and my goals would come directly from the conversation I had with my client before we started. Um, yeah, cause, and, and with all of the goals, I'm, I'm always trying to decide by the time someone is done with this conversation or by the time someone is done with this workshop, what are the X number of things someone needs to know? By the time I close this window, what should folks know? And those are my goals and objectives. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, so, so, so I, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go for it. Yes, I mean, so if, if we're still kind of going to use that example, I'm sorry, I, like that's literally like churning in my head now. Um, <laughs> you want to go yeah, back like, to, and change it? Yeah, yeah. No, no, we'll, let's, let's do inclusion in a remote environment. Okay. Um, so for inclusion in a re remote environment, actually, yeah, let's definitely talk about the gender non-binary one offline. But for inclusion in a remote environment, um, one of the goals would be, you know, first, how do we define a remote environment? That That is absolutely a goal. Like, we, I want to make sure that one of the goals is by the time we're done, we're all speaking the same language. So what exactly is a remote environment? Um, another goal that I would have would be um, understand um, understand ways and, and pathways of, of, of actually working in a remote environment. And again, this is, I would be much more refined with this if I'm actually really building a mm -hmm. workshop. Um, and then, you know, an, another thing would be um, practical practical examples of uh, what can happen, um, challenges of working in a remote environment. It's a, a thing of like, I, by the time we're done with any workshop that I give, I always want to give you a couple of examples of what to do when things go sideways. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, like those would be at least three different things that by the time this workshop is completed, these are things that I want you to be able to have in your pocket by the time this workshop is over. Yep. Yeah. And I think our approaches and I, the, one of the nice things about this is we have similar approaches, but we also differ too um, in our style. So hopefully this is going to be helpful for all of you. Um, I take on a similar approach of kind of listing out all the goals and objectives. And like I said, I try to keep things at three points. So um, I would probably condense these two um to basically the learning is like why and the how um which i think is the same thing right just less text because i hate text on slides <laughs> um and so for me i would have like the why why this matters because i think people are often like well why do i need to why do i need i've been working remotely and it's interesting like I've been working, both of us have been working remote and, and on distributed teams for a very long time, well before the pandemic. And so in a lot of ways, you might feel like you're an expert, but things are constantly changing, even in a remote workplace. And so it's important to be mindful that there's always opportunity for people to learn more. And so I always like to uh, just remind people that at the top of my workshops, like even if you are an expert at whatever else, please try to identify at least one new piece of information that you can take away from our discussion. Um, I always like to say the person next to you is always smarter at something than you are. So there's always opportunity to learn some something from another person. So I'll leave this for now, but you could condense this. Um, but I think there are always three things that I like to hit on in my workshops. There's always a learning element. So again, the what, the how, the why. Um, then there needs to be some sort of practice element um, because 
it's really hard for people to just take the awareness piece and learning and go implement it on on their own so when you come with practical examples as karen was saying and even sharing challenges you can present real scenarios sometimes i'll you know depending on the time limit if we have an hour right now and we're a small group i would probably just keep everyone in the main room virtually or if we're in person keep everyone together and we would go through probably two or three challenges ideally three um, different challenges relevant to a working environment and we would talk through different approaches and i would invite people to share um, if it was a larger group i would probably send people into breakouts or again if we're in person into small groups to huddle and look at those scenarios um, and then try to do a share out after so that we can talk through again a variety of approaches because there's not always just one approach to a scenario especially in the workplace and then the last piece that I always include, so there's always learning, practice, and then action. And for me, action is always, okay, what's at least one thing that you can do uh, leaving this session today that you can start to implement based on our discussion? Um, and I try to leave it pretty open-ended, so it really depends. If this is a ultra new group and they've never explored inclusion in the workplace, I would probably just say, what's one action that you can take moving forward? right? Keep it super open. That action could be they're going to go share this information with someone else who wasn't on the call. That action could be they're taking one of the best practice and the practices and they're going to start implementing it today. Um, it could mean insert whatever it is. Or if it's a group that I've worked with for some time and I know they're familiar with DEI work, I'm going to be more specific about that ask. So I might just say pick one thing that you can go do as a leader, as a team lead to start to foster inclusivity write it down, we're gonna check in with you in 30 days from now. So there's a spectrum of where that could be. But at the end of the day, you really, as Karen was saying, want people to walk away with something um, and something practical, not just some like, oh yeah, I learned this thing, that's cool. But we've been doing that. That's part of one of the, the things that has been uh, talked about very heavily recently with the DEI is dead, is like, we're kind of walking in circles. There's awareness, there's awareness, but then when do we actually take action? And so this is how you get people to take action. Um, and so it's part of the behavioral change. Also bringing this awareness is gonna help them start to open their eyes to issues that are related to processes and systems. And then the, the goal is that people start contributing to those changes as well. Anything to add, Karen, before we move on from goals, objectives? No, that's great. Okay, so I'll just say, what's one thing that you can implement? All right, so the other things that I didn't include here, and I'm just gonna slide a blank slide before that one. Um, I always do an intro um, with folks. I know that it also can be helpful. Where did my layout pages go? Uh, interesting. Oh, there we go. Um, I know it can also be helpful for people to know more about you before you facilitate, especially if you've never facilitated with them before. So you may want to send some sort of intro via email prior to your workshop. You may want to send links. Um, I've seen people do small, short intro videos. Some people like to send pre-work. I don't like to send a lot of pre-work for workshops because I think it leaves things open to interpretation, unless it's something very basic. Um, or a question for people to consider that I think will help save us some time in the workshop. I generally keep most of the learning elements to the, the live session. Um, Karen, do you take a similar approach or? Oh, I, I absolutely elements? refuse to send, I refuse to send pre-work for two reasons. One, no one does it. Um, like no, no one does it. And, and I, I also want to respect everyone's time. I mean, it's usually the people that I'm working with, especially in, in, you know, I see the middle managers, they're, they're eyeballs deep in work. And for me to sit and ask them to do all of this pre-work, it's kind of disrespectful to their time. Um, yeah. Post-work, absolutely, because you have a frame and a context, but I don't do pre-work at all. Um, I do also add, within my intro slide, I will add a little bit of biographical information, especially because I work primarily with tech companies. Um, I sent a little biographical information because I want people to know that I'm not just some random person who, you know, got a certificate somewhere and then, hi, here I am. It's, I am someone who has been in this industry for a while. Here is my background. I am coming to you as a peer and as someone who understands the nuances of your industry as opposed to just, I'm a DEI person. Yes. So I, I always include some biographical information also. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, 
the power of introductions is so important. Um, and it's something that I actually learned. Shout out to uh, Exponential Talent, which is a DEI consultancy based out of the West Coast. But um, they've been a great partner um, and also a group of great mentors for me as well over the past few years. And something I learned from them was this idea of powerful introductions and how we can set people up for success um, and disrupt bias by making introductions for others. But you can also do it for yourself, right? And it really does make a difference in how per people will perceive you and how people will engage with you um, during workshops. I've A-B tested it before where I'm just like, hey, I'm your facilitator, let's get into it, versus, hey, I'm Adrielle, here's the experience that I bring, here's what I'm uh, aiming to help you all accomplish, let's get into it, right? It provides a lot more context and um, starts to also build some of that trust as well. So always, always introduce yourself, uh, make it known who you are, what you're bringing to the table. The other thing that I would add before you even share the goals and objectives um, are your session norms or ways of working together. Um, some people like to say ground rules, but it's really important whenever you are having any sort of conversation around DEI to have people level set. Um, and it may seem elementary, but it is so necessary. So things like, uh, you know, being mindful of your airtime, uh, respecting others' viewpoints, um, uh, what else can we add here? Uh, interrupt the interruptions. <laughs> I always like to say respectfully. So if D'Amika is in the middle of sharing a thought and Karen cuts her off, I'll be like, wait, Karen, I think D'Amika was sharing something. What were you gonna say? Cool, all right, Karen, what did you wanna add on? Right, so it's a way to make sure that all voices are heard and you are literally practicing what you are about to preach in this workshop, which is fostering inclusivity in your working environment, right? Um, so um, you wanna list out your session norms. Um, to me, once you build out some of these aspects um, and kind of start to create your your library of sorts, you can just drag and drop these slides because things like your intro and your session norms are typically going to be roughly the same. Um, other things like maintain uh, confidentiality, I think, is a good one too. Um, so, like you know, we want to invite people to share stories, anecdotes, etc., but remind people like don't share any names, don't drop companies. Uh, even if it's a name of someone that was at a previous job, you never know who knows who. So share your anecdotes anonymously. <laughs> um, continue this conversation outside of our, our session anonymously. Uh, just be mindful of that too. So, um, Also be comfortable with being uncomfortable. There are yes. going to be things in this session. There are going to be things in this session that will challenge you. Um, do not immediately jump into, well, but what about, but sit for a second with it and figure out why you're having this reaction to it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and then I always remind people to ask questions and how yes. people ask questions during your session is really based on you as a facilitator. So always offer the question asking in a way that's comfortable for you. And what I mean by that is if you prefer people wait until you get to like your, uh, your, transition slides then ask them to hold off right or if you like me i'm like i tell people i'm like you can unmute and interrupt me mid-sentence you can raise a hand you can drop a chat uh it, you know whatever you want you can dm me so i i'm i'm comfortable with that but i know for some people it's easier to get through whatever it is they're talking about pause ask for questions and then move on um, and you do still want to pause periodically and ask for questions as you're facilitating because sometimes people are noodling on things and they're not sure when to, when to ask you. So always invite, solicit questions as well, feedback. I also welcome uh, opposing perspectives and viewpoints as well. So we've got our intro, we've got our session norms or ways of working together. Of course, you can add on more here um, and, you know, uh, customize this based on the audience. We've got our goals and objectives. Next, I usually will provide an agenda slide. Although it can feel a little duplicative of the goals and objectives, I do like to share how we're gonna move through the, the session. To me, I don't I don't think that that's duplicative at all. The the goals okay. are what the goals are what are we trying to do? The agenda yeah. is how exactly are we gonna do it? Yep. That, so to, to me to me those are, are two very different things. And also an agenda sets it sets the tone of what we're going to do. And also for folks who might feel like, oh, why am I here? It also gives you kind of a checklist of, okay, here's 
here's where we're going to go through it during the session. Definitely. definitely. So let's see, we're talking about inclusive, uh, building inclusion in a remote environment. Our goals are to cover these things. So um, I'm a huge fan of doing uh, pulse checks. So the first for for me, it's the learning portion, right? And so I would probably start with a check in on what this is. Um, and then we go into our practice mode, as we were saying, and then action. So I've kind of listed the 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 agenda here. Um, and you could, of course, flush this out. Um, and this is probably like action and next steps, because I know people love next steps. So that would be our agenda. Of course, you can flush this out as you see fit, but I want to power through so y'all can see what we're going to get into next. Um, I love transitional slides. I typically will um, make a handout version of my slides after sessions and provide it to my clients. Um, and they find it really helpful. So if anyone wants to reference back to this, it makes it really easy for them to reference the, the content. So. Our first section is on learning, right? So I would just make a little quick placeholder. And then before I share out what I want to educate people on, I like to ask, I like to do a pulse check. So to me, I would be like, what is a remote working environment? Or an alternative question, depending on what this group needs, could be, uh, what does inclusion mean to you? And this is a good way to get people engaged off the bat before you start teaching anything. And it's also a good way for you to gauge uh, the level of interaction that you're going to start to get during the session. It's also a good way to gauge where people are in their journey on learning about inclusive workplaces. Karen, thoughts, additions? No, I think this is great. Oh, I just got signed out. That is so weird. I don't know what just happened. Give me a second, y'all. Um, wow. All right, Google. <laughs> um, so a quick pulse check, and you could run this pulse check in a variety of ways, right? There are anonymous tools like Slido where you can um, pose some questions, run a poll. Uh, people can add in free text responses. You could use a Google Jamboard if you're not familiar. That is basically just a uh, virtual whiteboard that has a bunch of virtual post-its on it and people can anonymously add their thoughts so they can respond there. Um, and what I like to do is as people are responding, I will read them out. Um, you could also ask people to respond in the chat if you're working in Zoom as well. Um, but I'll go through and I'll just validate and read through those responses and remind people there are no right or wrong answers. We're just trying to get a sense of where we all are right now um, because the goal, one of our goals is to align on shared definitions, right? So once we've done our pulse check to get a sense of where we are, to get people talking. Um, oh, one other thing I'll add. If you don't want to just do a pulse check, you could also have people go into breakouts to have a quick discussion around these topics these two questions or one of these questions. Um, that's also a great way. And then they come back and they share out. So that's an, another option. But again, the, the idea is getting people engaged early on, getting them interested, getting them talking um, before you start just throwing information at them. Because I don't know about y'all, but I've gone to so many <laughs> workshops and trainings where people just start talking and I'm like, wait a minute. Like, you haven't got given me any runway. I'm not warmed up for this. So it can help to just get people's wheels turning, get them acclimated to the topic. Um, as Karen was saying, people are usually so busy. And so they probably got another window or email going on the side. But if you're asking them to engage, it's going to kind of bring their attention into the session. Um, so then after we get folks engaged, my next step would then be to go into our learning. So... Here is where we're introducing our first goals, two goals, right? Um, so what is a remote environment, ways to work in a remote environment? And you may be able to skip this. I mean, depending, I feel like right now, a lot of people, if they're already in a remote workplace, probably are familiar, but it does help to even just provide one, one line to align on a shared definition of what does remote work look like for us? Because each working environment is gonna be different. So 
here I would do, 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 do I would define remote work for our specific organization. And whenever I am facilitating, I like to use we and our. I like to make it make people feel like I'm part of their organization and I'm a collaborator. Um, so I don't say your environment, you all. I say us, we. I'm constantly using communal collective language to make them feel as if I am a thought partner because that's what I'm trying to be, right? And that's who I want to be for them. So I think that has a lot of power as well. Um, and that also leads into the workshop versus training piece too. So defining a remote work environment for our specific organization, um, what that looks like. So like we said before, ways to work. Um, this is shared definitions. So this is part of, and this is actually part of building your culture, especially if a uh, remote working environment is something that is new to your, orga your organization, this is an opportunity to start to define what that looks like. Um, community guidelines, if you will. There was a lot of research a few years ago about the power of community guidelines, ways of working together. Um, I think it was Google Rework that did a study on it and they really looked into psychological safety and all these other elements. but having this shared collective agreement on how we're working together can go a long way for setting the culture and tone within your organization. Um, so we've got our shared definitions of remote work. Then the next step is gonna be to educate people on inclusive best practices. Um, workplace, I'll say inclusive remote workplace best practices. And so here is where we would start to introduce some of those best practices, um, such as, you know, um, sending, there's a bunch of things you can do for meetings, right? So like sending agendas ahead of time, um, alternating um, the lead or facilitator. If you're a leader, uh, speaking last and soliciting input. Um, and the things that I'm listing, uh, there's research behind them. So I love actually linking uh, to various studies within my deck. Again, I always give a handout version after. So I usually will just add a little footer here and it has links so people can click them in the PDF version when they receive the handout. Um, so things like there have been a ton of studies about how uh, in workplaces, we tend to default to whatever the leader is saying. And so if leaders are intentional and take the effort to hold off and invite other perspectives and ideas before they share what they're thinking, um, people are more likely to get in the habit of speaking up and sharing ideas. So we would keep going with that. Um, also establishing for our team, how do we communicate? Um, and can, oh my goodness, I cannot type apparently. So how do we communicate for a, rare, a variety of reasons, right? If something is urgent, what are the preferred ways of communicating? If I'm providing project updates, how are we doing that? Is it in a project tracker of some sort? Is it in a, is it over Slack? Is it via email thread? I don't know, but aligning on how you communicate can go a long way to foster inclusivity. Um, also making sure that everyone on your team is aware of the roles and expectations of each person. Ooh, look at Google predicting what I wanna write and responsibilities. Look at this, this is creepy. I hate when it does that. <laughs> I'm like, I get it, but like, it always throws me off. Um, any other things you wanna add to best practices? I mean, I could go on and on on inclusive remote best practices but Karen, anything to add immediately that comes to mind? Um, I would also say for best practices, we talked about you know, meetings. I would also say flexibility. Understand that because it is a remote workplace, it is understand why people are remote. I mean, a lot of people are remote, not just because of, I don't want to go into the office, but because they're now dealing with the fact that they're caretakers, the fact that they're now dealing with parents and children, the fact that they have other responsibilities outside of just the workplace. So and have flexibility and boundaries around that. 
I think the boundaries are so important too, right? Um, and these kind of, I think there's a lot of overlap for these two, right? It's really understanding who does what on your team, you know, what are their schedules? What are their working hours? How can we, we respect that for meetings? You know, if you have people on the East Coast and the West Coast, making sure that you are considering equity whenever you're scheduling meetings. So sometimes people will have to sacrifice earlier in the day. Sometimes people will have to um, sacrifice later in the day. And that ties into flexibility as well, right? All right, so you could go on and identify your your best practices. One of the best things that you can do as you are building this out, or even ahead of the time before you build out, is ask your client, whoever you're partnering with, or if you're working internally, um, identify what are, what have been some of the major pain points, right, for them. Is it that people are struggling to speak up? If so, you want to lean into providing best practices towards ways to amplify your voice, right? Um, if it's people are, you know, struggling to, I don't know, set boundaries, you may want to share some best practices for how they can approach uh, setting boundaries. So definitely consider, again, the needs of people. There's never going to be a one size fits all approach. I think we could certainly, once we built this workshop, we could duplicate it and leverage it for other organizations and clients. But again, we still would have to go in and specify it and customize it to their needs. All right, so we've introduced our definitions. Um, we have shared some best practices and you may have additional uh, points here as well. Um, oh, we almost forgot. Why does this matter? Why are we here? And so I will usually include, I usually will um, go in the direction of why this matters by using data and studies. So I like to drive it home with it, um, keeping in mind that there's the, what do we call it, the head and heart, right? Some people are gonna be driven by the, this is the right thing to do sentiment, and other people are gonna be like, okay, what does this have to do with my business goals? That's the reality of it. Some people are in between, but I typically find people kind of land in one of those two areas of why does this matter? So um, here is where you would why this matters answer the why this matters and then you would add some data research etc um, and there are tons of resources out there catalyst gallup mckinsey i can think of so many deloitte does dei studies yeah hbr I, I, of course has a lot of research yeah uh, uh shrim S uh, shrim shrm does a yeah. lot of those studies too so you pick what makes sense and find the data that is relevant for what you're talking about and just add that in there. You don't need to spend a lot of time here, right? At the end of the day, we don't wanna, we're not here to be praised for touting the business case and pushing numbers. We're trying to, at least I'm not, I prefer to lean more heavily on the, here's what you can take away from this and action. So I like to, to save the medias part for the action and the planning. Um, all right, so we've covered the why this matters, what is remote work, we've aligned on shared definitions, we've shared some best practices. Now we want people to put this into practice. So I would, after that, insert my next section uh, of our agenda, which is our, whoops, our practice. So practice. And then um, I mentioned this early on, but what I would do here is I would share some scenarios. So I would have ideally three scenarios. So you could do this a couple of ways, right? Um, and I kind of walked through this earlier, but if you're a small group, let's say there's only like eight of us in this workshop or 10 of us in this workshop, I would keep everyone, if it's virtual, because this is a remote workshop, I would keep everyone in the main room of the Zoom or whatever tool you're using and we would just walk through these scenarios. I would read each one out loud. I would ask people to take a moment to consider how they might react or navigate the, si the situation. And then we would have an open discussion about it. I would invite people to share. Um, I always, always remind people throughout the session that they can share in a variety of ways. They can share by unmuting. They can share in the chat. They can message me directly and I will read out their response anonymously. So making sure that you're providing a variety of ways to interact is really important because 
there are different personality types, there's neurodiversity. Um, people will hesitate in a lot of situations if they're not comfortable. This is part of that, as Karen added to our session norms, pushing through or just sitting with that discomfort. Um, but you can still help by providing them with various channels. So I would add one scenario of remote work and I would duplicate this, like I said, three points. Um, and then the, the other option, of course, is if you have a larger group, let's say you're facilitating to 40, 50 people, uh, you could plan for breakouts. And so you could assign each group to a scenario or you could just tell them to pick one. <laughs> you, you figure it out, right? Um, but if you do decide to do breakouts, you absolutely want to give people a, a set of guidelines for those breakouts. Right. So things like, um, let me just breakouts. So things like how to choose someone. So again, if you were working with a very with a group that has not spent a lot of time having DEI conversations and it's clear to you that they are uncomfortable, you send folks into breakouts. You cannot go into every single breakout and make sure that people are doing okay. So you have to set them up for success, right? So something like um, choose one person to read the scenario out loud. Um, if no one volunteers, have them do something equitable. Uh, if no one volunteers, the person whose name is closest to the last letter of the alphabet. Yeah, I I really like doing those kinds of things to start because that way, you know, I waiting for somebody to step up, especially in in small breakout sessions, is very difficult. So I usually will pick things like um, again, like whose last name is closest to the top of the alphabet or. Um, who's wearing orange today or whatever, or something like that. Like that's this, hey, this is a good way of saying, please start. <laughs> I was struggling to unmute myself. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and same thing, like once you, and let's say we'll give them five minutes. Um, yeah, and I, I would also say at the very beginning, like even before we start sending people out to breakouts, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm someone who loves to send send a group out into breakouts because it gives people an opportunity to feel comfortable in having a conversation. So I'm even if there are ten people, I would do three. I would do three breakouts. So it's three people in each breakout, and one group would have four. Um, but it also gives people a chance to kind of think and process the information, or gives people a chance to gripe and complain about the session if they want to. I at this point. It's your chance to have, have a chat. Yeah, um, but I like to I like to set people up at the very beginning. Like as soon as I'm going to talk about a breakout, I'm going to say, "Okay, we're going to have a breakout session. Our breakout session will be five minutes long." And because again, I'm I'm very big in setting the stage for people at every stage of the process. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to tell people, "Hey, our breakout session is going to be five minutes long. I will give you a warning one minute to go." Um, so I'll do a broadcast of saying, hey, one minute to go left in the breakout session, and then we're going to come back and we're going to spend three minutes sharing what we've learned just so that people know what exactly our time frames are throughout all the sessions. Yep. Um, exactly. So you're kind of giving them a play by play. Um, again, sometimes it may feel like you're doing a lot, but you want to give people step by step so there's no confusion. Um, Absolutely. Uh, there, you provide as much clarity as possible. So, yes, I, I do the same thing with the time updates as well. Broadcast over Zoom, um, give people time warnings so they know. Sometimes they get zapped back because you know once that one minute countdown is up on Zoom, it's just it's like beam me up, Scotty. Um, so yeah, choosing one person to read the scenario, um, and then I would add, and I would, oops, I would also add like discuss. Uh, potential ways to navigate, um, choose one person to share out when we return. And then again, if no one uh, volunteers that practice, and then we'll return to share out and uh, invite additional perspectives. So a very, it's very clear, like play by play, we're letting people know what we're doing, we return. Um, then when people return, that's your opportunity to facilitate the discussion. Um, also, I like to remind them if you have questions or run into any problems, um, 
there is an option. Usually people can return to the main group and folks will grab me. I'll hop over to their um, session. One thing I've gotten in the habit of doing when I do breakouts is I will dial in separately on my phone <laughs> um, so that I don't lose my setup because I usually have a very clear setup with how I'm facilitating. Like I'm extra. I like to play like elevator music when I ask people to do like silent reflections and stuff. So when you join my session, there's probably some music playing. So I've got like Spotify open <laughs> to play the music. I've got the chat open. I've got the participants list open in case someone falls off the call and I have to re-add them. Um, and you know, it, it comes with practice. I know some people like to have um, someone support them when they're facilitating to, to kind of manage the virtual stuff. So if you are not comfortable managing or facilitating the logistics of your workshop, you may wanna consider having someone support that. Um, but if you are like me and you don't have someone typically on to support you logistically, dialing in separately from another device, your phone can go a long way for those breakouts because then you can just assign yourself, your second self, <laughs> to the breakouts to support um, people as they need it. So pro tip, virtual facilitation pro tip. Um, so we give our, our breakouts, we give the scenarios. When people, if you do the breakouts, when people return, I always like to go through and read out the scenarios, especially because not all of the groups have looked at all three scenarios. So I'll read each one out, invite the groups that were assigned to this one to share their perspectives, um, ask the rest of the group if they would approach this differently or have any thoughts or questions, and then we move through each of them. Um, one thing we have not touched on so far is time. And so, you know, you have to be mindful as you're building your workshops of how you're going to schedule all of this. And so you may find it helpful to build out, uh, to just kind of keep a post-it as you're building out and just writing your time. Um, I'm sorry that slipped my mind to kind of <laughs> do from the beginning. I've done so many workshops that I already kind of know, like by now we are probably gonna have 10 minutes left in this workshop by the point where we are now. And it doesn't seem like it, but once you start having those conversations, you send people into breakouts, you pause for questions and ideas and thoughts, by the time you finish going through these three scenarios, you're probably gonna have 10 minutes left. Well, and and here's here's where I think you and I differ in workshops. As like I don't, like I I don't do the time check, but I will yeah. rehearse the workshop enough uh, so that I could I could feel where it feels, um, and it also gives me the flexibility to know kind of if I need to speed up or not because I have practiced the workshop and practiced the flow. Um, I tend not to do time counts because for me, I want to start aligning to the time count. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it doesn't give me the flexibility to, to kind of flow the conversation if needed. Um, right. So yeah, so I, I think especially if you are someone who is newer to creating a workshop, definitely start with the time counts. Um, but because for me, because of my, my background, I just, I kind of like to and just feel where it feels within the workshop itself. I gotta watch you like build one of these out before, <laughs> at least once then because I, I don't, I'm not gonna lie to y'all I don't I don't do the like if I'm if I'm facilitating content that's not mine then of course I, I rehearse but that's rare these days um, so I think my rehearsal kind of comes as I'm going through um, and as I'm building this I am usually like I'm building out my speaker notes too that's something else that we didn't do so I would be slide by slide writing what I want to say um, some of them I, I, I won't add speaker notes like these things have I've repeated my session norm so many times at this point <laughs> they're pretty much ingrained but when there are meteor parts right like when I want to define what remote work is I'm going to add some speaking just some quick bullet points to trigger me and remind me what I want to cover in each section um, but yeah you you definitely hopefully this helps those of you that are on live with us and that are going to see the recording, there are different approaches to facilitation, preparing for your facilitation. Um, and so figure out what works best for you. Um, and, you know, of course, as you're planning your time, really think about what's the most important thing that you want to make sure you hit on, because sometimes you do run out of time. Like I, I've ran out of time several times when it gets to the action planning portion, um, which to me, is the most important because I want people to take something away. So I try to be very mindful and cautious around that. Um, 
but it doesn't always happen. You know, sometimes you get into a workshop and then someone asks a really great question or a really great discussion happens and you have to on the fly decide, do I let this to consume some of the time um, or do I try to, do I decide to table this? Um, and so that comes with practice where you decide what conversations are relevant and should be heard by the entire group versus which ones you think may be sidetracked and, and uh, diverting the conversation. Um, and another thing that I do to kind of help with facilitation, and I, I did this kind of as a product manager, is to uh, have someone be the uh, kind of your assistant. Mm, I hate that term. Um, but, you know, to have someone say, hey, Karen, I'm, I'm going to ask you to be the person to keep track of the things that we're going to put in our parking lot or keep track of the per of the things that we may want to talk about later just so that I can stay focused on the conversation. Because I know I also have a very bad habit of ruminating on things in the back of my head and like kind of keeping things flowing in my head. So if I can have someone else parking lot some items, then I know and I now have a trigger in my head that hey, there are items at the parking lot, so we need to at some point go back and check check what that means. So for me, I also know that no matter where I am in my session, 10 minutes, 10 minutes till, I want to go back and look at the parking lot. So I know, okay, great, now that I have three items at the parking lot, I know I now have to pull back, so 10 minutes in, I need to go back to it. So that means all of my content I need to now truncate so that I know that I have at least 10 minutes to go back to the parking lot. Yep. And that could also be, it could be the person that's helping you with the logistics of the workshop too, who's just keeping some notes. Um, there are also some AI tools out here now that I've seen that are plugins and they will take notes for you on your Zoom call. I, I can't, I still can't wrap my head around it, but. Um, yeah, Otter, Otter AI is really, really, really good at yeah. having it as a plugin that, that it works really great as a transcription service. It also works really great in pulling out notes for you. So. Also, pay pay for the pro edition of Otter AI. It's actually, it's fantastic. I have to check that out for sure. Um, all right. So we went through our scenarios and then we have our last section, right? So let's just go back, jump to our objectives, our goals. We've covered the learning portion. We went through the practice portion um, with those scenarios that have practical examples, challenges. Always, always when you are... Um, creating your scenarios, check with the person or the group that you're partnering with so that the scenarios are realistic and relevant to what they do, right? So don't give them, if they are, you know, a, uh, I don't know, marketing agency, you don't want to give them uh, examples that are from a food industry tech company. I don't know, I'm just making up something, right? But make sure it's relevant. Identify what are some of the common issues and challenges that they've been facing when it comes to inclusion in the remote workplace um, and then build your scenarios around that um, and be careful not to make them so specific if there's been like a specific issue that it like calls out someone but again make them relevant so people are like oh yeah I've seen something like this before or I, yeah I've seen something similar and I just didn't know how to navigate it it, it can go a long way thanks for joining us Damika um, or Demeka, I'm sorry if I mispronounced, please correct me. Um, so we've got our, we're coming up on our third and final section here, um, which of course is the action planning. So here is where I would want to give people a few quiet minutes to reflect usually um, and identify at least that one action. So what's one action that you can take and when, and when I talk about one action you could take immediately, um, again, I'm, again, I'm very, very big on setting up, um, setting up expectations and frameworks. So for me, I, I wouldn't even say immediately. I would say, what is one action you can take in the next 30 days? Or what is one action yeah. you can take in the next seven days? Um, because that way, like immediately don't mean immediately for everybody. For me, immediately means what can I do as soon as I hit end? But right, for some right. people immediately might be, you know, when I get around to it. When I have to. <laughs> yes. Yep. And you can always provide examples here too, right? Um, I think we touched on a few of them earlier. Like, is my action going to be sharing agendas for my meetings moving forward? Is it going to be um, 
I just want to share this knowledge with someone else or talk to someone on my team and figure out how we might incorporate a couple of these things. That is an action. Um, and so don't be afraid to share examples with them. Um, depending on the group, I usually like to ask people to share their action. And again, you can do this anonymously or not. So if the, if the group, if there's enough psychological safety and y'all can just share it out in the chat, cool. Um, but maybe you need to anonymize it. So again, using a tool like Slido or a Jamboard where everyone can add their one action and you can kind of read them out again and validate them. Um, and then your next step, and I think we're pretty much coming on the, coming up on the end of our session is what's next? Yes. And so what do we do with all this great information aside from that one action? And it could be, you know, in 30 days, we're gonna check up or we are going to have another workshop in the next month or two, uh, mm -hmm. which I think as we talked about during our last um, live session here on LinkedIn and YouTube is, you know, these micro learnings can go a really long way. So this session can be an hour. We give people that 30 days to implement something and then we come back and do a check-in, introduce something else and it just keeps going. Um, and it might even be, you just continue the conversation on inclusive workplace for the next session. It doesn't necessarily have to be a completely different topic. It could just be layering on and even exploring how people have taken action uh, since the previous session. So anything to add, Karen? Um, no, I, I think I think that, that this is actually a good framework. I think the only other thing that I might add is um, before the action to do a recap. Um, I, I still abide by what I learned in my like sociology training. Tell yes. them what you're going to tell them, Definitely. tell them and then tell them what you told them. Um, so I probably would do a, a recap of, hey, so here are here are your takeaways, just in case you weren't paying any attention at all. Here are your takeaways of the things that you should know by the time we are done with the session. And then I would exactly. go into, all right, so now what are you going to do about it? Yep. And that's why I forgot I grabbed this slide, this uh, particular deck, because I like this. Um, it was something like this you could use, right? That covers the three sections that we covered. So again, what do we learn? What do we practice? And you can list out those things below here, right? And then next steps. So this is your takeaways slash recap. Cool. And I and I and I really I always like to think about it in that sense of, so for the person who was in the back of the room who wasn't paying, now nah, lick of attention to nothing. <laughs> right. Here's just here's the slide case. for you. <laughs> just in case, just in case. Um, and you can even like well, I, add this. I sound, I sound super country on that. I'm so sorry, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell you can tell I'm from Texas. I, I love it. it happens love every it. often. <laughs> yes. So yeah, that is, that really covers it. Um, of course, you can add your your wrap up at the end. I always like to add a slide uh, with you know if you have questions, here's how to reach out to me. Um, so like your thanks contact. Um, if you have to cite sources at the end, you can also do that, uh, like in the appendix of your deck. Um, again, I usually just cite my sources in the footer of every slide as it's relevant. Um, yeah, I think that covers everything. Wow, we really got through that in an hour. I, I am impressed because sometimes it takes me a minute to <laughs> build workshops. But again, this is also a bare bones template. So hopefully folks found this helpful. Um, maybe we'll drop this somewhere if anyone wants to. Yeah, and actually, you know what? I Because because I'm a big fan of making sure that people collect things that are actually going to be used, I yeah. think that if we charge a single doll hair for them, um, because I actually research shows that people using things for free to not to actually use them, the second you charge anybody anything for something, then all of a sudden they're like, oh yeah, that actually mm -hmm. should be something I should use. Mm. Um, so I think we charge one single doll hair. Um, that that can, can can actually um have some updates and we can actually flesh it out a little bit more too of just kind of why we're adding some things in there so i think that that should be something we could drop it'd be pretty yeah. easy to do um once we clean it up we'll add it to the comment section uh both here and on youtube and yeah let us know if you have any follow-up questions um i know we we mentioned i think it was demeka demika and george you had some thoughts around uh, workshop topics. So we're happy to continue that conversation. Just drop us a note. 
Um, we hope this was helpful. Thank y'all as always for joining us. Um, not sure what we're talking about next week, but oh wait, no, Actually, we're talking about yeah, product yeah, next week. Yeah, we're talking about product next week. We're I'm very excited. I, I'm, a, I'm already getting ready. I'm like, I'm ready stretching. We're talking, we're talking about yes. product next week. Oh yeah, DEI <laughs> and product, which I think is very, very important right now, especially as AI is moving very quickly. So, um, we hope to see you there. I'll share some information for next week's session. And yeah, thank you all again for joining us. Uh, until thank you. Next time. All right, bye, y'all.